Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me in the locker room this afternoon. I'm Alan Locker. The Bold and the Beautiful's John McCook and Jennifer Garris are here today to celebrate the recent nuptials, the remarriage of their characters, Eric Forrester and Donna Logan. John McCook joined the cast of The Bold and the Beautiful as an original cast member 37 years ago this month. And he won his first Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series in 2022. Discovered by legendary movie mogul Jack Warner while appearing as Tony in the New York City Center revival of West Side Story, John was one of the last actors formed by the Hollywood Studio System and Talent Development Program. Universal Studios later signed him as a contract player before being drafted by the U.S. Army for a two-year stint. Jennifer Garris joined the cast as one of the Logan sisters, Donna, in 2006. She started her career as Grace Turner on The Young and the Restless back in 1997. Before launching her acting career, she worked in New York City as a model, appearing in the pages of leading publications such as Glamour, Fitness, Esquire, and Women's Wear Daily. Please help me welcome to the locker room, John McCook and Jennifer Garris. Hey, hey, Hi there. Hey. Hello. I'm gonna look for those. Thank magazines. you so much. <laughs> well, I'm gonna look for all those episodes that you've done. Is, is it? It was theater, the West Side. That was, yeah. So, but, do yeah. you have a? You don't have a picture of it or any? No, actually, I don't. No. I don't. But Shucks. you know, no. no. <laughs> Maybe you can reenact. Gone, gone with the wind. Reenacted during this interview. Gone with the wind. Cell phones didn't exist when that That's when right. he he did when he did no. Tony. No, definitely, definitely not. John, before we get started, I really. Um, wanted to say how much I enjoyed having your wife, Lorette, and son, Jake, on the show to discuss their book, The Cliffs of Schizophrenia. The book has been out for a few months now. How's Jake doing, and what what's the reaction been to the book? Well, the reaction to the book is wonderful. Uh, people who've read it uh, really found it very helpful and very uh, enlightening. It's, it's wonderful. It's not a self-help book. It's just a, a story of their journey through it and uh, alternate chapters. It's a wonderful book and, and, and it's been doing really, really well. It's finally, uh, it's finally available. Uh, the publishing world is something that uh, Lorette and Jake and I weren't really familiar with. And it's very complicated once you get something published. Now there's distribution and there's sales and there's, you know, trying to get it in the right places and Amazon and, you know, Barnes and Noble. And it's been very complicated, but it's doing really well right now. So it's taken us it's taken two or three months to get it moving, and it's moving now. So we're really grateful to you for uh, talking to them about it. And uh, Jake was nervous about being on camera and talking, but he he sparked to it, and and you were very kind. So I appreciate your help. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And you you say it wasn't a self help, but it really was. I mean, there were a lot of people watching when we were live, and you know, just listening to both of them, they people were learning and people who also had children with schizophrenia. So there were, there were a lot of great lessons that they shared. So I'm, I'm glad to hear it's out there for people um, because it will help whether it was, you know, uh, True. written as a self-help. It will yeah. help. We've heard from many, many, many people who, who have schizophrenia in their lives with, with uh, small children or adult children or, or or relatives and it's out there and so sure it's a really uh it's it's a subject that needs to be talked about and we're really and proud of the book yeah destigmatized obviously yeah a I'm so absolutely proud of, i'm so proud of john too for standing by them and doing sure we such are an amazing job he's such a good father we're very lucky as a family to be together and to have to be able to take care of Jake. He's very lucky and we're very lucky that we can do it together. So uh, it's, oh, it's I, 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 I could see by uh, Molly's videos and uh, you know, that she was posting on social media, right? Your mom, uh, daughter. <laughs> yeah. Mom. yeah. Yeah. She, uh, everybody uh, doing their part. Well, Jennifer, as I said, in the intro, the show will celebrate thir their 37th anniversary later this month. This July will be 18 years for you. How did the role of Donna come about? I was, when you were saying 1997, I started on Young and the Restless. I'm like, that's more than a quarter of a century. Boy, I'm old. <laughs> wow. But then this one, I mean, hello. Well, yeah. yeah. We, we legendary. Go back. Really legendary. Legendary. Cell phone before anything. 
<laughs> it was back in big man time. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, we used to show, we used to hunt buffalo and then come to work. Um, so I'm just yeah, I love I. This is my home away from home. When I first moved to LA in 1997, I didn't know a single person in this town, and now wow. look at me, I get to hang out here at Buffalo <laughs> with all these people. It's so fantastic. Um, and I was across the hallway in Young and the Restless. Yeah. So um, they were my first friends, Sharon Case and Tamara Clatterbuck and Lauren Woodland. They were my first friends, Heather Tom. Um, and I'm still hanging out with them. Actually, I'm seeing Tamara tonight. Uh, so it's- I love that. How did they, Did who came to you with the idea for you to come and uh, play this role? Uh, very interesting. So I was about 34. And um, I believe 34 when I decided to quit the industry and go to business school. And I graduated. Oh, no, no, no. I need for the role of Donna. That's what, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So I, okay. So I was oh, going you... to leave the industry. I decided to take my GMATs, which is the, the, the test to get into grad school for your MBA. And I always knew I was going to do that path. When I graduated from college, I had a job offer with Ernst & Young, which is one of the big accounting firms. And I put it on pause to be an actress and a model for a minute, knowing that I would always go back. I, I, I was going to ask you about the schooling thing because I didn't realize. Yeah, that was the um, plan. That well, no, no, no. I didn't realize the, the first degree and the second degree were spaced but apart. They were very. Oh, believe me. <laughs> going back <laughs> as a student in their 30s, hanging out Bravo. with a bunch of 22 year old kids. I was like, oh, my goodness. I am so good old. for you. That is incredible. But um, literally the second day of class at Pepperdine University, um, after doing uh, taking up accounting and economics, the most strenuous classes there for the MBA, Brad Bell calls and is like, hey, Donna Logan, or hey, Jennifer Garris, would you like to be Donna Logan on our show? We, we remember you from Grace Turner on Young and the Restless. And um, I was like, ah. Twist my arm, like twist my arm. I, it, it was not the plan, but you know, it was great. And I, I thought to myself, no matter what, I'm going to still graduate with this degree because, you know, acting is up and down and they can take away your job. Um, but if you have a degree, you have it for life and they're not going to take that away. So I, I completed both. I had storyline with you. Yeah. When you started, you were still going to school. I was still going to school here. Yeah. and I was supposed to do the two year program, but because I had so much dialogue and so much work here, I did the four year and I did, I graduated yeah. and, I'm, and I'm still here. How did, I, I don't well, know how that well, happened. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bradley Bell for paying for my, you know, MBA, I would say. <laughs> right. Um, I didn't have any student loans. That was a very nice thing. That is that. cool. Amazing. Um, That's amazing. So, That's really, really a great really story. I didn't realize. Fun. Yeah, I, I um, Brad has, you know, Brad and Bill, I'm so eternally grateful to the family for always giving me opportunities. And just when there's a lull and I think, oh, it's done, something else happens. And I just keep getting surprised by more and more story and wonderful story. So I am so grateful beyond words, really. I, I love We've that. We've been very lucky, been the, last, lucky. the last four or five, for the last three, four or five months of uh, this big, big story arc that we've been able to play with, with Eric and Donna. And, you know, they'll say this stories about, you know, Eric's dying and all that. But, but I, as far as I'm concerned, this was really uh, Eric and, and Donna's love story. Uh, that was the through line for it, for me, the ups and downs with the designing and the competition with bridge and all that was all very, very strong and, and really wonderful to play. But underneath it all was was this love story, and and I I want that to continue, and it is. So there we are. It's nice. That's awesome, John. We <laughs> spoke. We spoke in uh, two thousand uh, twenty one for the thirty fourth anniversary, and you you said then that you were still learning while working on this show. Is that what keeps you, you know? bringing you back year after year besides the paycheck? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, uh, besides the paycheck is a funny, that's a lovely phrase, and it's true. Uh, <laughs> we constantly learn, you know, and I, I admit to that. I, uh, I, I love that. Uh, even uh, mostly in this story, when, when Eric was very sick and he was afraid, he was frightened 
of uh, dying and such a strong, uh, powerful accomplishment. And scared of what was going on in his life was a new experience for me. And it was, it was fun to add that to Eric. But what I learned was not to, um, not to get lost in all the words and all the dialogue, but to rather to put it, put it here in your pocket. I mean, learn it and bring it with you, but then, and then stop thinking about it and, and go, go with the emotion. And that's what I try to say to any of the actors here that if they ask me about it, which the young ones do because they're too naive to know to ask somebody else who might have a better <laughs> but, um, I love to say on a soap opera, learn your dialogue because that's what you're doing. But, but, but when it comes to doing scenes, Dialogue is dialogue is like wardrobe. It's it's what you're wearing today. It's what you're saying today. But it's not what the scene is about. And you've given me that advice. Yeah, the on scene a few is occasions. A, the scene is about something else. Uh -huh. The scene is about everything else under it. And and so learn the dialogue and bring it with you and have it because that's what we're doing. Throw it away. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. let it, let it be back there. And I've uh, that's new to me. That's that's new information after 37 years here. You know. Yeah. I'm still learning. And it can be very difficult to, I mean, when you have one, the, one of those days that it's a monologue after a monologue after monologue, it, the, you you could be out there thinking, what's my next line? What's my, but then it takes you out of the acting. It's so true. Like, yeah. it's just like, you got to do it, study it, know it, and then toss it away because otherwise you're not in it. That's the best advice uh, in theater too. Like say summer stock, when you only have a week to get going and you're going to open Monday night. And and you're worried about it now. It's opening night. Oh my God! And I don't know know my lines. And the point is, somebody will say the lines are in there. The lines are there. Just go with the play. Do and, the play, and and it'll be there. And, and also, is. not even just the lines. I know that sometimes one time in the hospital scene, I think I was like, you know, you come in, you're like, oh, I've got to do it this way, and I've got to do it this way, and you have in your mind like maybe how you're going to do it. And I remember I did do a scene probably that way. And then the next time you said, just say it. Yeah. Just yeah. say it. I was like, right. I'll just do that. <laughs> <laughs> Angelique says you. Oh yeah. Angelique says you two are a dynamic duo. I love to see you two together on screen. Oh, and yeah. Caroline said to you, Jennifer, I'm so proud of you for thinking that way. I have my master's in education. You're oh. so right. You have your degree for life. Yes, you have your degree. And hi, Angelique. How are you? I can't. She's in the Netherlands. She's. It must be late there now. <laughs> you know. it, it is. Yeah. It's, about yeah. nine, it's about nine p.m. I. Uh, I told. I think she had messaged me asking me what time it was in the Netherlands. <laughs> um, and and yeah. I know that well because that's where my parents were born and raised. So. Oh wow! Good. Good. Yeah. So. And it's definitely one thing I always want to teach my children: education. They. Sure. You do that first. Most important. Yes. That's exactly what my parents said. You do whatever you want, but first graduate from yeah. college. Yeah. And then we'll support any decisions you make. That's a hard <laughs> thing to learn when you're 18 years old, <laughs> but it's it's true. It, it is. Well, as I said, Donna and Eric were recently remarried with uh, my pal, Lauren St. Victor Carter officiating. Tell us about the wedding and what was different about where your two characters are the second time around. Do you want to start or should I? Start? No, go ahead. What's different? Oh, well, what was different about well, this one? She has a one? degree now. She had two degrees. That's <laughs> right. what, what and two children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's what was different about this wedding for sure? The last wedding, obviously, I knew it was coming. Um, I knew exactly what to expect. I knew who was going to be there. I planned it. This one was spontaneous. And it's really funny because um a typical day here at Bold Beautiful, we were up first and it was a big day and a lot of people. Uh, we actually, which is never happens, we didn't get a chance to really run our lines, mm -hmm. which is unheard of because, uh, you know, we're like very religiously running our lines. Um, but it actually ended up working for this wedding because it was spontaneous. The character did, uh, my character didn't know it was coming. So why would I be rehearsed? So during the actual wedding, like, there were things that I messed up on because I was just like, oh my God, I'm so, so this is like, my character was that way. Like, so um, taken aback that this was happening. So yeah. uh, besides herself that she didn't know what to do. 
and it I think it kind of showed the spontaneity of that kind of showed through in the scene. It did. It did. Uh, one of the things that was funny is that uh, we did the rings, uh, you know, uh, spontaneously, and and she didn't know there were going to be rings, but I had rings because I was pretty sure she'd say yes. Uh, anyway, we had rings, and then we went to the ceremony and gave them to uh, Carter, and he gave the rings, and he said, he said, Donna, put this ring on Eric's finger and repeat after me. And she took my my right hand, and I said, no, she has to take my left hand. And that was and giggles. It, it, it made like, us laugh, you know. It, it was funny, yeah. and and that was uh, one of the uh, things that were funny about it. I was like, I, please keep that in. I told the director, please, please keep that in. And then there was another line that I really messed up on because you're not rehearsed. I mean, when you know you're getting married, you're rehearsing the lines. You're probably nervous as anything to say those lines, but when you're not expecting it, so I I, I don't know if they kept that one in. I don't, I don't but there were either. some there were some really funny moments in there that were spontaneous and real. And it made us all laugh, you know, all of the characters that were there. It was fun <laughs> and it was relaxed for everybody. So that was very different. It was different. Uh, also, I think the, the spontaneity of it, you know, uh, say a week or two before that, Eric's um, Eric was almost I, I don't want I don't like using the word manic but but it was very it Eric really needed to get things done he wanted to say how much he loved everybody and he wanted everyone to know that and because he knew he was dying and he didn't know everybody else was so that that he was kind of manic about stuff but then when this happened it was because he wanted to do it today in joy not not in in uh in 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 a in a fearful yeah. way but in a joyful way let's do this together this is fun and so that's what was different about it uh, and 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 we're different people now these two characters and these two actors too we're, we're different actors and we're different characters and so um it was really wonderful for all the others in the scene as well not just for the two of us but for for Ridge and Brooke and and and, and all of them, uh, all, everybody who was there it was really fun. Well, and it's great for the audience who's who's you know, like you said, grown with you too. Like you know, experienced the first one and they've been around for the ride. So I, I love that, um, John. You've had a few wives uh, on the Be bold and the beautiful. So um, just the first thing that comes to mind when I mention the these ladies, Susan Flannery. Uh, well, conflict, you know, <laughs> uh, and I, I, say that with, I say that with, with great uh, respect because that was Susan's as an actress and as a, as an expert in daytime television, Susan would say when we had a scene and yeah, she, we were together for 25 years on the show. If we had a scene with Martini's talking about Ridge's love life or Thorne, who's Thorne going to, you know, take to the prom, uh, uh, she we would go, it would be boring, and she would say, "Where's the conflict? Where's the conflict? If you're going to have a sweet, sweet scene, you have to come up with some kind of underlying, if not negative, there needs to be some kind of tension there." Mm -hmm. And she said, "Otherwise, it's boring. It's boring to play, and it's boring to watch." And so I, that's what I think of her. And she was absolutely right. I, I was, learned a great deal from her. I was not married to Susan Flannery. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a great deal from her. She was somewhat of a mentor for me when I first started. Oh. I, listen, I had some experience with Young and the Restless, but still, I was still, I still felt newish mm -hmm. to the world of acting. I guess you always feel new. Um, and she gave me great advice. Sometimes I was like, how am I going to do this scene? How are you going to pull my hair? You're going to do this. What, how am I going to do this? I'm in lingerie. Ah, like, I didn't know what to do. And she just always, like you said, always gave the best advice. Like yeah. there's got to be conflict or there's got to be this or that. Like mm -hmm. she always knew how to layer a scene so that it wasn't just one thing. She was a how challenge. Was she was a challenge to every actor on the show. And to the directors too, and to the writers. Precisely. You know, she'd come up here to the office and say, "What are you doing? What are you doing here?" You know, I don't mean to. She didn't talk like that. <laughs> yeah, right. It was. But, but but it but was. She, she had demands, you know, uh, and she was right. And, she and, always made it better. Yeah. So right. And what, what I, I was going to say is the demands were because she wanted it to be the best it could possibly mm -hmm. be, and that's a, that's a great way way to do it. Like she's doing it for the audience as well. Um, and how lucky for Jennifer and all the other young cast members to be surrounded by John and, and people like Susan that you, you do get to absorb. Oh, like, me. I'm so lucky. And like, starting over at Young and the Restless, I worked with Eric Braden, 
he was a mentor <laughs> to me then. I felt like I was so green. Like at that point in time, I, I, it was you're lucky you're alive. <laughs> but I mean, I feel so blessed. I mean, Heather Tom and Catherine Kelly Lang and my sisters. I'm, yeah. Well, that I, John, your next, your next wife, Catherine Kelly Lang. What well, Kelly, oh my goodness. Well, Kelly was, you know, she was here on the first day as well. And uh, um, I think that what I, what I feel about Kelly is what Eric felt about Kelly, about, about Brooke, is that she was sweet and lovely and honest and, uh, and tender and a lot of things that he felt he didn't have in his life with Stephanie. Uh, and, and so that's why he was drawn to her. And then she was so wounded by uh, her storyline with, with uh, Ridge when Ridge chose Carolina. These are really old stories. Um, anyway, that's, that's how I feel about Kelly. And I still do. I think she's very vulnerable in her scenes. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to be in the man with, to be the man in the scene with her. Yeah, it's wonderful to be in scenes with Kelly, always. And Miss Kimberlyn Brown, who uh, had some story this week. <laughs> well, she has, hasn't she? Well, that's she sort of the end of an era here on on Bold and Beautiful uh, for for Kimberlyn uh, for step for uh, Sheila. Sheila. I can't even say her name. I can't even say her name. <laughs> uh, uh, the the story that Eric, the arc that Eric played with her was that she was charming and funny and beautiful and smart and. Uh, and he fell in love with her, you know, and, and it's a very hard thing for him to admit now. Uh, and he feels very guilty about it. But then when, when everybody in the family saw and began to see that she was evil long before Eric did, you know, I thought he was dumb as a rock in those years. Um, he's a lot smarter now. But, but <laughs> he, so. uh, he, he was so taken by uh, how much he loved her. He didn't want to admit those things. But everybody else saw it before he did. Anyway, that's uh, that was a very interesting arc for him to play and uh, to have to admit that he made a mistake that big, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rena Sofer, who played Quinn? Rena, my goodness. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've Rena. had a few wives. Many. I love Rena. I thought she's a really wonderful actor, as she is. And, and uh, she enjoyed playing the... Uh, playing playing this uh, this character and she had uh, duplicity going on she she wasn't a hundred percent into Eric or she was but she wasn't and she had that conflict to play within herself not something that Eric saw and then that that storyline that she and I uh, ended up playing uh, was very very challenging for me as a, as a man and as an actor and uh, and then for him to make the mistake of encouraging her to find a relationship outside their relationship so that she would stay in the house with him. You know, this is a big mistake for Eric. So, um, but I think he was very much in love with her, you know, beautiful and smart. Once again, you know, these characters uh, have their own allure, every one of them, you know. Mm hmm. Absolutely. What are some of your favorite storylines over the years? Jennifer, you want to go first? Oh, um, geez. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> right with this one. Anything with this one is a good one. Um, also, with makes Alan. it easy. Oh, no. Him? No, it's not. Does he make it, it easy? It's kind of the same thing that you were, we were saying about Susan. I just feel like I'm so lucky I get to play with these. He's legendary. Come on. I mean, John McCook is legendary. He's been acting for decades and he's so good and so genuine and just so real. And he makes me a better actress, honestly. So I'm so excited when I get to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody like John. And, um, and he makes it fun. Not just that. Yes, he makes it fun. It's always fun to work. I know if I'm coming to work with and I have scenes with John. It's going to be a good day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be yeah, a good day. Yeah, we do. Day. We do. We uh, trust each other. Yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we, I try to explain this often, uh, but, but we, we, we're very dependent on each other here to do good work. You can't do good work by yourself. You, you mm -hmm. have to, it's, and it's, it's like sport. I mean, that's the metaphor. It's like playing tennis. You know, if you play 
with someone who's better than you are, your game is better to, to compete with them. But this isn't competition. This is this is a dependency and and uh, back and forth that we we need to love each other. And and because we're so vulnerable to each other, we actually uh, it actually we develop a love and 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 a, um, a confidence and a connection with each other that's very very necessary mm-hmm. here. And, uh, and people you don't realize work. that. You also love that. I, of course, a hundred percent, I agree with that. And that makes it the, let the connection very strong, but also you love and respect and you care about the work. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. really care about the work. You want to go out there and do a good job. You know, we, we, we can be s- cynical about story, this story or that story, or these particular scripts or, the storyline that's going over there and you go, nah, you know, or I don't like that. It's like being a vis- being a, one of the viewers, you know, if you don't like it, just hang on, it'll change and there'll be a new story. Right. There. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I don't agree with all the stories that we, we tell or what I see they're writing for other people or for me or for anything. I don't agree with everything, but we love the work. And so the, the, the con, the, uh, the conflict, uh, the, the, uh, challenge, is is to uh, rise to that occasion and put away put away any uh, disagreement you might have with the story and play it for the people. It has to be real. We have to make this real, and it's not easy. Always, it's not easy, and we can't. It's hard to it's hard to do this without look like without acting. You know, we're trying not to be acting and you know, try not to catch each other acting all the time. And it's very hard because we're acting 24 hours a day. here. You know? <laughs> and it's very hard to take that that curse off of, of some of the soap opera dialogue we do or some of the story we do. Uh, it's hard. You have to stop being judgmental about this. If you're going to judge this as something less than you want to do, then don't do it. And it also goes yeah. back to the connection that. I feel like the connection we have, the, whatever words they put on the page, as mushy and as romantic as it could possibly be, I can relate to it because I love you. You're like, just, I love John. Donna loves Eric. But, you know, what he was saying is, it's, it can't, you can, you make it work. Yes, you can, right. We can make it work. Yeah. No yeah. matter what they say. <laughs> I, I love what you said about, you know, you don't always love what you see on screen or the other storylines. I mean, you know, I, I try to say to, to to viewers who who get upset at something or think uh, an executive producer is trying to tank a show, and I, I try to tell people that nobody is trying to tank a show. They are trying to make it the best they can be, and there will always be those ebbs and flows. It's just, you know, when you're writing this much television, it's impossible to be great 100% of the time. I, I have so, uh, I'm so intimidated by the idea of a how many pages they write, how many scenes they write, and oh my goodness, you know, and and uh, it's 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 a daunting task to write these shows and have so many eight shows a week and and more, and, and it's it's a step. Isn't it's that a part of being on a soap opera? Sometimes they love you and sometimes they hate you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, wow. as long as it's like half and half, I think you're okay. <laughs> That's and there's a lot of love. Here yeah. today, they love the character, they yeah. hate the character. It's all yeah. good as long as you're talking about the character. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Correct. But there's love. There's a ton of people watching from the United States. But Finland has said hello. Uh, the Netherlands is here. Poland is here. Those are what I've seen so far. But uh, that's good. Yeah, we're so proud that our show does so well all over the world. Uh, uh, we generalize that, and I don't mean to, but. Uh, uh, we're very, very proud to be in in these mm. different countries. I mean, I don't know how many, 80, 90, 100 countries. They're incredible. In different languages. and uh, It's funny. It's great. Before I go on vacation now, I always think, am I on in that country? Because it will be a different vacation if I am. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you can't walk, yeah. We can't walk on the streets in Rome or, or, or in Milan or Tel Aviv or, or, or Johannesburg. You know, we, we're movie stars in these places in a way that, that we don't that we don't feel here. Of course, there are there's real movie stars here, you know, walking around. So, <laughs> so back there. But uh, but the fact is that we are uh, iconic in these countries because these shows are so popular. Australia, it's so huge there, and and uh, it's an amazing thing for us. And it, you know, I one of the things I want to say about the soap opera thing and the fact that we're you know 
how come you're so successful so soon, so early in the early 90s in these countries overseas? Uh, and uh, the show got sold overseas a lot in, in these international markets. But one of the reasons is because it was short. It was a half hour show and it was easy to watch. And it was like a comic, like a comic strip, like the old ones. Uh, I can't think of the names of Brenda Starr and some of these, these old comic strips, which were not funny. They were romantic and there were only five panels a day. And you turn the page and wait till tomorrow. And that's what it's like. And so if you don't like, if you don't particularly like this, don't worry, it'll be different tomorrow. <laughs> don't worry, well, you know, turn the page. So uh, that's that's the thing. Um, I, I thought it was that, because you were also glamorous and wonderful and it's about the fashion industry. Sure, well, yeah. <laughs> that probably too, that probably yeah. too. Well, Sweden just said hello in Canada as well. Um, uh, thanks. John, what did, you know, uh, the storyline that you just played, Facing Your Own Mortality, what did it mean being given that storyline. And, you know, I'm 57. I think of things about mortality as, as I get older. You know, how, how was that for you? Well, it was, uh, it was uh, it's funny. I, I say it was like Saturday, a Saturday Night Live sketch when I turned the page on a script for next week. And I see it, Eric coughs up blood. He coughs up blood. And I, you know, I'm calling my agent now and say, what's well, the word on the street? You know, uh, it's just it's aging soap actor sees that he's, uh, he's a death star. Uh, I was immediately uh, assured by Brad and, and, and powers that be, um, uh, well, he is the power that be, isn't he? Um, that this was uh, a good long story arc and didn't mean the end of my career, but it was wonderful for me to play because it made me realize how much you think when you think there's a there's an ending down there two months away or two weeks away or two years away that you have to start thinking what what do i have to accomplish what do i have to do before the end of that time and for eric to have to uh, do one more design one more collection and for him to compete with ridge and that you know for him, he had so much he had to do and he almost ignored everything else. To, uh, uh, it made him do what I think happens to a lot of people. I have to get this done. I have to get all this done before I die. Um, I get that. I understand that. But uh, knowing that it wasn't going to be the end of my character made it uh, easier to play, I think. <laughs> and then, you know, also, I think if, if, if John McCook really was retiring, from our show, I I would hope that that's what they would write for me, some kind of wonderful long story arc uh, where I could say goodbye to everybody on the show and have uh, scenes like I had to tell everybody how much I loved them and what they meant to me uh, and have them react to me. Uh, it, was, it was very, very good. It was really good. We are live right now. Yes, yeah, she's doing her. I'm too, doing an right? Instagram live. I love it. I, I love usually it. Usually do. Actually, I'm very... I'm still learning all the social media, all the younger kids on the show. It changes also. very quickly. Yeah, it does. I can't keep up. It, so, it's interesting, yeah. you you know, John talking about that story because Trevor St. John on The Young and the Restless, his new movie, um, A Good Enough Day, is sort of about saying goodbye. You know, he's got a terminal illness and, you know, making amends and all of those things. So sure, interesting. Sure. Go, to my, go to my bio and join us. <laughs> look at her, look at her. She's not doing this, she's doing that now. No, I know. <laughs> it's it's wonderful. For you. Yeah. One, one of the fans just said you're on Instagram too. Um, <laughs> talk about you, John. You just talked about you know, speaking of your leader, talk about you know, Brad Bell as an executive producer, head writer, friend. I think, um, you. you know, Brad has uh, well, Brad changed my life. Uh, his father certainly did. I, I, I had never done a soap before when I did The Young and the Restless in 1975. I joined that show and it was only two years old, I think. Uh, it was very young and I joined it and it was a half hour show and live on tape. And, you know, I was a theater guy, so that didn't freak me out, the fact that it was live. But but I had to sing and I had to dance with a girl on my first day. And I thought, what the hell? What am I doing here? Um, I was very impressed with it and, and impressed with how good everyone was. Um, and comfortable with it. And so um, that was 
that was Brad's dad who brought me into this world. And then uh, how many years, seven, 10 years later, uh, in 1987, uh, after I had left YNR and gone for like six or seven years, then uh, Bill called and uh, asked me to come back and do start this show with Susan Flannery. And he said, yeah, I want Susan Flannery and you. And if I can get you two, I can go ahead and cast the rest of the show because we'll have a good start, you know. And that's how we did. But um, very soon, Brad took over. I mean, right away. Brad took over heading up the show and re and and co-writing it with his dad. And then his dad stepped stepped aside and let Brad take over. And Brad did. And she he did it uh, with flying colors. And so um, we have we have a really nice camaraderie, the two of us. I think he he considers me part of his father's generation or, or certainly part of the early uh, part of, of Bell Phillip on 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 CBS and uh, and I am so so it's a really nice connection back with his mom and dad uh, for him uh, and for me to share. Um, what a way to honor them too by just you know right continuing to honor what his dad began. Absolutely, and he's doing he yeah. does it very well. And once again, I'm I'm stunned <laughs> by how much work he's able to get done with his writing staff and with everybody here. Uh, uh, on the show, I'm stunned that they can deliver all this work for us to accomplish every day. And I, I don't know if you know, but in 1997, when I started over at Young and the Restless, I didn't try out for Grace Turner. I tried out for Victoria. So ah. I did not, yes, I did not get Victoria. And I was like, oh, okay, I was bummed out. They're like, well, you didn't get Victoria, but you're perfect for this other role, Grace Turner. So that's when Bill was very involved. I don't know how much Brad, Brad is kind of my age. I don't know how involved he was at that point. In he time. wasn't yet, but I mean, he was going to school. He was going to UCLA and you so, know, he was out here yeah. going to school. Yeah. yeah. So in 1997, when I started Young and the Restless, it was all Bill. And I do remember the storyline was his baby. The storyline with Cassie and Sharon mm -hmm. and Alice, which was the adopted mother. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved in that storyline. Wow, and wow. that was ugh, ages ago, but that was Bill Bell's baby. I remember. So, did you and Heather basically start at the same time? We started about the same time, and yeah, we became friends. Wow, hanging wow. out there at Young and the Restless, and still to this day. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. Wow. I had lunch. I had lunch yesterday with with Ray Wise, the actor Ray Wise, and the actor. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Jerry, Jerry Lacey and I, and uh, Jerry and Ray both were on Young and Restless, and and Ray was actually on Young and Restless and Bold and Beautiful. Uh, Ray wow. Wise won won his uh, he won one of his Emmys for being guest star on Bold and Beautiful years ago, you know. And I'm going, wow. what? We forget that we've all had our hands in all these other, and those two guys were in New oh, York Ashley, soaps together. I mean, years ago. Ashley Jones too was over there. Yeah, Ashley sure. Jones was over at Weiner. Sure. A bunch of us. Yeah. These shows are constant and your actors dip their toes in them and come back out. And many famous movie stars have uh, come through soap acting in New York City, mostly. Join mostly. Me. Join me and, uh, and all of us uh, celebrate that. And we have so many people in common that we know from spending uh, time in the trenches here, you know? And it is the trenches. I love that. It Jennifer, is. speak about the Logan sisters you know, working with Heather and Catherine Kelly and, you know, seeing Heather go from acting to directing as well. You know, you, you came up through the ranks with her and now you, she's directing you here. I'm, I'm just enamored by all these girls and everything they do. I, I mean, I just, I, I try to balance my home life and my soap life and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's enough. But these girls all have businesses on the side. I mean, Kelly has her yeah. cap hands. She's opened a, a store in Beverly Hills. She goes to Italy and Australia every single break to sell her on QB's, the home shopping network. Right. Heather's doing directing, directed Dynasty, many episodes of the primetime show Dynasty. And now here, Ashley the same. She's doing Lifetime She's movies. Too. Yeah. I, I do not know how these girls, they know how to juggle for sure. And they're good moms too. They're good moms, and Kelly's a good grandmother. I, I'm, 
I'm amazed on how much energy. It's good that she she uh, she gives them credit, but she gets a lot of credit too because she's raising two babies. She has a wonderful marriage and a beautiful house in L.A. and and she's a happy girl. But she does juggle it, you know. She's it's, she talks about you know. I had to drop him off. I can't stay. I got to go. I got to pick up my son. <laughs> go ahead. Got, Jeez, um, get out of here. You know. It is it is really a blessing to be on this show in particular because it is a half hour. So we do usually get done early and we do have time off. So it is a blessing being a mom and able to take them to the volleyball match or game and take them to the soccer game or whatever. And I'm always participating in all these different activities that my kids do. And I think if you're an actor, actress, you know, a film actress, you'd be on location somewhere. You wouldn't be able to do any of these things. So. Or if you had a prime time show prime like time. one of the CSIs or whatever, you're working five days, six days a week. You're working, uh, you know, very early in the morning until it's dark at night. You don't yeah. see the sun. You barely see your Hurry kids or wait, your spouse. Right? It's very demanding to do work on film or to do these primetime shows. So the soap world has flexibility. And uh, it's a very wonderful place to be if you're a, a family man or woman. There were many years that I was traveling to Africa, to Germany, to Canada, to Bulgaria to do movies. I think my passport got so full. I had to get extra pages in my passport. Uh, because I was traveling so much doing whether it's like modeling or 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 film or anything. And um, my goodness, like I could not you can't you can't raise a family and do that sort of thing. I mean, you could, but not for me. That would not be for me. This job is a blessing. It really yeah. is. I, I love that. John, you know, we talked earlier about your, you know, being discovered while playing uh, in West Side Story. What what do you remember about that? He he saw you on stage and was well. You know, I, I it, it it my the bio is a little misleading. I was in West Side Story, a city center. It was a a, a revival of the show. The first time West Side Story had been back in New York since it had been there originally, uh, uh, and and the company that played it had been on tour in Europe, and they came back to New York and they were doing this thing at City Center for I think we were at a five week run. And I was an understudy for Tony. And uh, and so if you're in a show in New York and, and you're auditioning for your reading for studio executives and for studio casting people all the time. And uh, that was it. I, I, tour, I, uh, I, I auditioned for uh, to play Ensign Pulver in Mr. Roberts, a uh, comedy that they were going to do out here in Burbank. And as a possible Ensign Pulver, they signed me under contract. I mean, they were just like that way with their contracts. They didn't fly you out or have you come to audition. They just put you under contract. So here I came. I came right back to Burbank after being in New York for, I mean, less than six months. I went to New York to do theater, you know, to be to be in theater. And I was a little bit. And then um, the, the theater I've done. Lots of theater, lots of musical theater, but that was all in the Midwest and in summer stock and so on. That was just my little piece of New York City. And uh, then I came back and here I am at Burbank and, and I'm meeting Jack Warner and he tried to change my name and I got my name changed back. And I did a little TV and you know, on camera. Little TV. You know, well, little that, TV. That, Have you that, seen that? Was that? Well, that was after, but yeah. then, then I left Warner Brothers because Jack Warner didn't want to have contract players anymore, sent me to Universal, and that's when I got drafted, and I spent my two years in the Army. But then when I came back, then was when I did all the theater, I mean, all, all the television I did, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, into into Young and Restless. And then leaving, it was those years from 1980 to 87, those early 80s. When I did so much TV, oh all the sitcoms and you know all, all the, the love classic. boats and all that. Love I was just going to say there was such such great TV at that time. Yeah, for, and for it's, an interesting, it's an interesting sort of agent actor thing. When I left Young and Restless, and and so uh, and I left on good terms with Bill. Uh, it expanded to an hour, and I wasn't obligated to stay, so I left. So now I'm this eight by ten glossy. I'm I'm an eight by ten in a tuxedo. That's who John McCook was after being a Lance Prentice. And my agent is going, nobody that they, they wouldn't, nobody would would audition me to play a dad or a lawyer or a teacher because I was an eight by ten glossy in a tuxedo. And so my agent said, You're good at comedy. 
I'm going to stop submitting you for all these things. And I'm only going to submit you for comedy shows. And so that's what he did. And that's when I started working. I did all the three's company and, and, you know, uh, uh, all the, all the shows, family ties, yeah. and all of that. And, uh, did you do the Carol Burnett show too? I, no, I worked with Carol in theater. Oh, theater. Then, yeah. Theater. theater. I knew Carol from this okay. building and, and got to do some theater with her. So that's, that's where I did all that stuff. But it was that the agent said, let's stop submitting you for these, these smart agent shows. And smart let's have agent. You do huh? Smart what? agent. Yeah, he was. He was. He is. He still is. Harry oh, Potter. Writing, Fantasy yeah. Island. Oh, that's. <laughs> She's it's looking it up. I love it. P.I. The beauty of it is that those Fantasy. shows were there to do. I you mean, know, in those years, first. you could make a good living just guest. Do on. you have a favorite, John? Yeah, uh, my favorite funny show was Family Ties when I played a thing called. Uh, 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 proper penguin. It was uh, it was a commercial that that uh, that the mom on that show got. Meredith Baxter. I was the actor in a tuxedo playing uh, playing the guy talking about uh, frozen food, and uh, <laughs> it was very funny. He was a what about the proper penguin? You can see that. You can go to proper penguin on and check it out on Family Ties. I love that. Yeah, Jennifer. Where did your love of acting begin? Oh boy, um, this is kind of a crazy story. Uh, I was an exchange student in Spain, and um, I uh, I was staying with a fam family, and these two girls, my sisters, my exchange sisters, said, "Oh, you should enter this beauty pageant." I was like, oh, "No, I'm not doing a beauty pageant. No way." So they pushed me into it because of the prizes There were like really great prizes and they wanted, they wanted the prizes. So they pushed me into it and I ended up winning. I don't know how I won, but I did. And it was the um, hair. So. It was the hair. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, all the prizes, I was like, Oh, this is pretty in cool. Spain, you know, like, in Spain. I was Miss Malaga, Mesquita, Miss Malaga, Mesquita, España. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I came back to the United States. And I was like, oh, this is, a, this is an interesting way to make a living. Just enter beauty pageants. So at, by the end of the summer, I was Miss Hawaiian Tropic USA. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I traveled around with the Hawaiian Tropic crew. I, I, we did like commercials in Greece, photo shoots in Hawaii. We, did, we went to the Cannes Film Festival. We did so many different things um, wow. with all the girls. And I was like, okay. And they were all actresses. They were all aspiring actresses. And I was still in college, so I had no idea what that world was. I mean, when you were in my family, you were either a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or an accountant, something like that. You did not do acting. So um, these girls, just they just exposed me to this life that I had no idea about any of it. And um, it just like one thing led to the, to the next and it happened. I don't know. That's basically the story. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I like to bring all those, all those all trophies, my little trophies and put them in my You know, room. it's funny. My mom and dad are moving out of their home and they had five kids. So it's like they had like six bedrooms and it was, they've accumulated so many things with all the children. And because they're selling the home and they're moving out, they're getting rid of their things. So they're, they're sending me boxes and boxes and boxes of my old magazine articles of my modeling and my trophies and my ribbons and my I also was a swimmer. So I have a bunch of those trophies. Yeah, that, yeah. So like my my I'm like, okay, that's enough. I, I that's funny. Yeah. It's funny when you get to be a grown up like we are and and all that stuff from high school and from college oh. and uh, and uh, the competitions that you were in. I, wow, all the athletic things too. Uh and you go, I, I, I can't that. throw these away, but what are, I don't want them. And you go, <laughs> you kids want you, you kids want these? And they go, no. Well, I want that. our new and house is very traditional. Our old house was very modern, so there was no place for that. The old house was like glass and wood, and that was it. But this house, I have an entire office to myself that has like shelving. So it's hey, like she actually put a lot of that stuff in there. Go and I, it there. I, not just that, my grandfather had made a lot of, uh, at the end of his life, he painted a lot of oil paintings of the water. So oh, I yeah. actually now finally have a place to hang all of his artwork. So perfect. It's good. really good. cool. I like from every grandparent or from 
any relative. I have a letter that he wrote from um, the time of war to um, his wife. And like, I just have everything framed and it's like kind of, it's just like, it just makes me feel like safe and at home when I'm there, even though I'm like thousands of miles away and some of the, my grandparents are no longer with me. It just, it's like a good feeling it's home. That's oh, what that means really for. Good, good. You know, uh, the Bold and the Beautiful fans have your exchange sisters to thank for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, some yeah, I wonder what they're doing now. I try to get in touch. They, with them. they oh really God. pushed you, pushed you out the door and, and began this path. Yeah, I, I don't know what they're up to anymore. I've tried to get in touch with them and I just, you know, you would think that you'd be able to with Facebook and yeah. Instagram and yeah. things, but I, I we'll see. <laughs> I was Maybe definitely in school, uh, John, uh, when <laughs> you were Lance on Young and the Restless. But I do remember that character. I remember Jamie Lynn Bauer. Um, what do you remember about working with Jamie Lynn and Jeannie Cooper when you first got there? Well, that was uh, that was trial by fire, really. Uh, uh, they had been there for a while. And uh, Jeannie, I never had scenes with Jeannie Cooper. I just... Uh, we, you know, we, we enjoyed each other a lot and said nasty things to each other in the hall. But, uh, <laughs> that that but, you can't uh, repeat here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jamie Lynn Bauer was a free, free spirit. And uh, uh, funny because she wasn't from the theater. Uh, she wasn't from a classic place or, or she was uh, she knew how to do this. And, and that's what she knew to do. And it was live on tape. So. Uh, it, there was no time to do anything. You do a scene, and now the fade to black, and the and the recording machine would just continue. And you could they could insert the uh, commercials onto that, and then they no. would fade up on the next scene. So if you had a bed scene, for instance, uh, right. you would have first you have a scene at dinner, you know, and they fade to black. Now when it comes up in the next scene, you're going to be in bed together. So you're changing clothes, and you're getting down to nothing, and you're getting under the covers and it fades up on you into making a having a love scene and so on and then they fade out on that and now you have to go and run this it was really fun and very challenging and she uh was able to hop into bed and and be this this wonderful uh sexy you know girl and then and then hop in and be a, be this sophisticated uh uh soap opera actress in the next scene and I learned a lot from her about that. So did you change in front of each other on set because there's no time to go Yeah, room? that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking. We would. Sure. I mean, you'd it, strip it, down, she would strip down to it, like a tube top and yeah. shorts and get under the covers. And there we are looking like we're in, in bed together. It was fun. And you it, It's funny. I don't know if I'm making this up in my head, John, but what? looking at Jennifer right now, I see a little of Jamie Lynn. <laughs> like, I don't uh, know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but this is uh, way different. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to read this, John. Bernie Appoglazy, I had the honor of working with John McCook in a tour of Carousel many years ago, and he was not only one of the most talented artists I ever learned from, but he was one of the nicest and classiest. He treated every person in the cast like we were his best friend. For a young performer starting out, that was the best. Wow, that's cool to hear. Uh, that was uh, that was in Pittsburgh years ago. Uh, Carousel is a lovely show to do, and I didn't get to do it more than that one time. But uh, I enjoyed doing that. And then I, I uh, when when you get to be above the title, when you get to be one of the lead people going into stock. Then then there's you know there's eight or twelve or sixteen chorus kids, uh, younger actors. And singers and dancers that are in the in the ensemble, and uh, and that's where I had been. I mean, I spent the first year of my career in the, in the ensemble of musical theater, and working with all kinds of different stars from Hollywood and so on. But but being one of the ones in the chorus, and and I would see these actors from Hollywood or from Broadway or from television come and go as we did the shows over and over again, and learning new shows, new actors would come in. And I observed a lot of people who were above the title in our business. And, uh, and some of them were, most of them were really accomplished, confident people, but some of them were not. And some of them weren't as nice as others. 
And some of them were insecure, actually. And so I would watch them and, I, and you see how they treated other people. And I learned that I want to be like that. I want to be this way. I don't want to do that. And I, you know, it's, it's also learning what you don't want to do and what you don't want to be. And I think I learned early on uh, that uh, being kind to people and, and, and having fun with it is way more important than anything, than how you do in that scene. You know, I had an actor say to me many, many years ago uh, in a summer stock situation where it was like, we haven't rehearsed this enough. Oh my God, and we're opening tomorrow night. And, we're and, and, and the actor just grabbed someone by the, by the shirt and said, stop it. Now this isn't, if this isn't fun, it's too hard. So calm down and enjoy it because it is hard. So let's have this, let's do it and make it fun. Okay. Let's go. And, and I, that's my philosophy. Now, if it's not fun, it's too hard. I love that. Love that. Uh, Jennifer, Eddie Cibrian and Joshua Mara were your pairings on Young and the Restless. I think it was more Joshua, not Eddie. Um, but Joshua, yeah, we had a very good connection, uh, the two of us. And um, Donna, or not Donna, Grace and Nick, oh, it was on fire. That was my, <laughs> I was thrown into the fire when I first moved. I, I felt, like I said, I felt so green in 1997. I remember my little brother was um, in LA the weekend I got the job and I got a, like scripts, this, like this many scripts. And I was like, oh my God, I can't go out with you at all, David. He's like, not even at all. I'm like, no, I have to memorize all of this. Like I had no idea. Like you take it, take it one day at a time, one day at a time. The night before you look at the next day and then you continue. But um, I was thrown into the fire of this storyline with Sharon and Joshua and uh, Grace, my character accidentally slept with Nick who was Sharon's husband at the time. Accidentally. And accidentally. Yeah, accidentally. Yeah, so yeah. Happened, nah, but nah, whatever. Nah. But um, it was, it was steamy. The fans loved it. We had a lot of sex scenes, like, and a lot of like very um, sexy scenes, not just sex scenes, like the air conditioning would break in the office and I'd be like, so hot. I have to take off my, 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 my nylons or my, whatever, my jacket. And it was just like, I was like, how am I going to do this without smiling or laughing or cracking up? And it was like, these scenes were like over the top, taking off my nylon, putting I my so. heels up on the, the desk, taking off. All Why my... did you ever do that with me? I don't understand. <laughs> but it was steamy. It was fun. So, Joshua and I had a blast working together. We would always be laughing. He's and, cool. Um, He's a very yeah. cool guy. And then my character went over uh, for a moment. I don't remember how many episodes. Uh, maybe a few times, actually, to be with Joshua again. And I'm not sure if it was a fantasy or it was real. or I can't remember. It all blends together. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you do but as much, was, when you two do as blast. much, you know, dialogue, I don't know how you could remember any of it, it was, at all. Yeah. It was really fun. And Sharon Case was such a such a good actress to work with. She's still one of my very best friends. And she pulls you into the scene when you look at her eyes and she just sucks you right in. It's just, she's amazing. It was a really, it was good for me to go there and learn these. Yeah. It was, it was, it was basically my acting school. It was acting school for me. Like I learned how to be an actress at Young and the Restless. Not not a bad place to uh, get training, and I got paid for it. <laughs> right, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on top of that, before I let you go, John, um, you have four ki kids and how many grandchildren? How many grandchildren? Now, see, three, five, five, five. five. That's what I thought. For, we're what, hoping what's for... what's what's the best part of being a granddad? Well, they you know they just think you're the best thing in the world, and. Uh, uh, the best thing is that you get to send them home, of course, uh, when you're done. <laughs> uh, no, it's great to have, you know, you remember when your own children were little and uh, how they adored you. And then uh, that all evolves and they change and, and kids grow up. And then when the little ones come along, grandkids, they look at you like your kids did, like your kids did when they were little. So that's uh, it's very evocative of that time. And it's it's very Youthening, it's very energizing. Do you spoil them? Of course, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. And, and how did motherhood to Gavin and Sophia change your life? Jeez, 
if I knew how good it was, I would have started a long time ago. I would have started in my 20s and had like 10 of them. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I always thought like I lived a really good life before my kids. I traveled. I had fun. I partied. I was I, it was everything was wonderful. But then I had my babies and I was like, oh, this is life like this is this is the life like what I did before was insignificant compared to what I'm doing now, I think personally good it's good. really it's and, and it's they're ridiculous. teenagers right they're both teenagers. 13, Sophia's 11 so it's like oh, really cool. amazing time and discovering themselves and who their personalities and who they are who they want to be it's it's really it's amazing any any, any what's this any inkling that they might follow in mom's footsteps um Sophia is I would say more so she plays, she dabbles in music and, and piano and singing and, but I'm not going to push her to do it. I'm going to just like my parents did for me, you get your education and you go to college and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> they, they need to follow in mom's educational footsteps yeah. first. Before that. I'm not yeah. going to say well, if she wants to major in musical <laughs> theater, go ahead. I'm not going to, but you have to go to college, yeah. 100%. Good for you. Good for you. And this was a pleasure. John, please say hello to your wife and Jake for me. I will. I will. I promise. I will. And then once again, thank you for supporting them in that. And uh, I'm very excited for what's going on for them. So thank you. Thanks. For, I'll say I'll say that for you. Absolutely. Jennifer, a pleasure to meet you. I hope, I hope you had fun. Oh, I did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, you too. Everybody, don't forget, tune in to the Bold and the Beautiful weekdays on CBS. Have a great weekend, everybody. You Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take Bye. care. Thanks, everybody, for joining me today and to John McCook and Jennifer Garris for stopping by. Please join me next Wednesday, March 6th, when director, writer, and actress Alicia Coppola stops by to discuss her new short film, And You Are. Alicia will bring one of the stars of the film, Zach Barrick. The other star of the film is Jane Seymour along with her. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you want to stream the locker room, um, search the locker room on your favorite streaming platform. I hope you all have a great weekend. And as always, please, please stay safe.